tonight on Tabitha Takes Over. My business is really, really slow, and I don't know why. I just want to come here and not lift a finger. How have you been keeping your salon afloat? We borrowed against my husband's 401k, and we live off credit cards. Brooke gave that client an earful. Right. That's not About good. how you're never there, and you don't care, so why should they care? Tabitha is the biggest bitch I've ever met. That's very grateful of you for someone who is using her husband's retirement money to bankroll her failing business. Maybe not being able to take criticism is why you are here in the first place. I know this kind of behavior is characteristic of all the Save My Business shows, but I thought that this episode of Tabitha Takes Over brings up an interesting situation, and it's something that's fairly exclusive to women because women typically don't marry men who make less than they do. When I was a yoga teacher, I worked for quite a few failing yoga studios that had been open for years. When you're new at teaching, you work for pretty much anyone who will hire you. I kept thinking, you've been open for three years and there's no one taking any of these classes. How are you still in business? It's like fifty dollars to $100,000 to open up a studio and rent in the area I was in was probably four dollars to $6,000 a month. How can you afford this? Then I would meet or hear about the husband of the owner and it would all make sense. She runs the family business, and her husband makes up the cost so she can have her dream. And it's not just the husband that suffers when she does this. All of the employees suffer as well, particularly in a salon where their income is highly based on how many clients they see and how many tips they get. She doesn't have to do anything, though, because her failures are being paid for. With that said, allow me to introduce the show. This is Tabitha Takes Over. Tabitha Takes Over was a show on Bravo that ran for five seasons from 2008 to 2013. Tabitha Coffee is a hairstylist who goes into hair salons to keep them from failing. And sometimes she does bars and hotels too. The show is essentially kitchen nightmares. In this episode, we have Kim Crone who runs Salon Deco in Atlanta, Georgia and had been in business for 10 years at the time of the episode. Let's get into the episode, but first, a word from this video's sponsor, Sandman. How to partner? The Brave browser protects your privacy and gets you back in the saddle, making it safe to surf the web again, ad-free. Even Vladimir Putin probably uses it. If you do choose to see ads, you get paid for your attention in cryptocurrency. If you're still using YouTube on Google Chrome, then my pet horse is laughing at you. <coughs> Don't let the stallions of Silicon Valley spy on you and mount you like a prize pony. Download Brave by clicking on the link down below. So at the start of the show, Tabitha set cameras all around Kim's business. In this next scene, Tabitha and Kim watch and discuss some of the things the staff is doing and experiencing. Look at it, it's all empty. <laughs> all of it. Please tell me there's one towel in there. No, ma'am. Great. Right off the bat, we know that Kim is lazy because she's not even providing her employees the supplies they need to do their job. I'm sure that's something quite a lot of us can sympathize with in the jobs we've worked at. As an employee, it's really annoying when a manager can't even get the basics of a job correct, and something like that might breed malcontent in the staff. For example, Take a look at this. Well, I'm trying to tell her what the f*** is going on since she hasn't been here and she's late and she's like, I just don't have time for this. Whatever. I'm not going to worry about her if she doesn't worry about us. Imagine you are trying to run a business and you have one of your employees telling your customers that you are a horrible boss who doesn't care about the employees. Well, that's not a business where I would want to spend my money. Not to mention that if I am paying someone to do a service for me, I don't want to hear them complain about their problems the whole time. I am paying you, so everything should be about me. If anything, as a stylist who wants good tips and wants to make a lot of money, you should be listening to the client's problems instead of ranting about your own. That's communication skills 101. If you want people to like you, just sit and listen to them talk. The stylist who wants good tips should be using various conversation techniques to get her clients to talk more about themselves. That's how you make money. What has happened here, though, is that Kim has earned that treatment from her employees. Ideally, Kim should be such a great manager that all her employees should be talking about is how great she is. Oh, she is the best stylist I have ever met. I love this company. We are treated so well here. That's the kind of business I want to attend. 
I don't want to attend a business where the staff is angry all the time. But Kim brushes all that away with the "it's hard to find good help" excuse. The staff, they just need to be a more team player. What does that mean? I just want everyone to be adult-like, to come in looking good and do your job. So your complaint is that you want your staff to come in and do their job when you barely even show up. You want them to act like adults when you aren't acting like an adult. There is no do as I say, not as I do. In reality, people work off modeled behavior. If you want good employees, then you have to show them what good is by being a good boss. Same thing if you want good friends. Same thing if you want good children. Same thing if you want a good family. Stop expecting to be rewarded with good people when you aren't a good person yourself. Look at what Kim is doing to her husband and her family. And how much have you borrowed against your husband's four hundred one k? About eighty grand. That's a lot. And it has to be really stressful. Yeah, we're foreclosing on our house. That's astonishing to me, and that has to be really hard. But you kind of say it like it's no big deal, like it's a throwaway. We bought the house when we were doing really well in the salon. Bottom line, and I just can't afford to keep it all. That sounds like you chose your salon over your house. Yes, yes, I did. How does your husband feel about it? I mean, he's very supportive of me. Of course, he is. Obviously, he wouldn't be doing this. She is choosing her failing business over having a house to live in when she has two children that are three and five years old. Are you out of your mind? Do you even listen to the opinions of the people around you? Tabitha interviews her husband later in the show, and he is like crying during the interview over the thought of losing his house. Does Kim even care to listen to her husband? No. Her diagnosis of how her husband feels is that he wants her to keep the failing business over their home. She doesn't listen to her employees either. Tabitha interviews the employees without Kim being there, and they all essentially say the same thing. So tell me what you guys think is going on in the salon and what's going on with Kim. She doesn't seem to care. She wants to not have to run the salon. I should be able to have my salon, and they should make money for me, and I should not have to do a damn thing. Wow. I think a lot of business owners don't realize, particularly when someone else is subsidizing their failure, that the reason they own that business is because they are supposed to be the champion of the staff. You are the best on the team, and you are there to make sure your employees and your clients are taken care of, so that everyone goes home happy. It's not just something where you can put a few dollars down and expect everyone else to do the work for you. That's not how a successful small business works. This is why you don't hand people a free business like her husband is doing. When you do that, they don't build the muscle they need to carry the responsibility of being a manager. If she has financial problems, she should fix them herself. Every manager who owns a successful small business that I have seen works constantly, like twelve, fourteen-hour days. Kim doesn't want to put that kind of effort in, and that's what causes her to make dumb mistakes like this. These are your business cards, obviously. Salon Deco, the best kept secret. Why would you want to keep your business a secret? Because people don't really know that we're here. <laughs> exactly. That's a really effective marketing campaign. Salon Deco. Shh. Now we get to the most important part of the assessment, which is the actual skill of the hairstylist. If you aren't good at what you do, people aren't going to pay you. You have to be so good that people are willing to give you money for your work. Let's see Kim's work. So you want your hair cut like Jennifer Aniston? Yes. Is that, that what is. you're thinking?、Mm -hmm. Let's see. I kind of want to measure it to see if you have eight inches. Would you be? That doesn't look like eight inches. We're close. I'm really confused. Why did you want to measure if your client had eight inches of hair? Because if anybody cuts off their hair, I think they should definitely donate it. Okay, but you need to follow the thought through to your client because it was like you were having a conversation inside your head that was actually coming outside. <laughs> When you are a customer at a business, you want to walk in there and feel like everything is being handled. If I get my hair cut at Salon Deco, I don't want to have a care in the world because I know they are going to take care of me. If the salon owner tells me that she wants to cut my hair shorter than I want it cut and doesn't tell me why, I don't feel relaxed. Now, instead of relaxing, I have to spend the entire haircut watching her to make sure she doesn't screw it up or do something I don't want. That makes me want to go somewhere else. I've noticed several stylists, including Kim, use foil boards to do their highlights. 
Professional stylists shouldn't be using a foiling board as a crutch, and they certainly shouldn't be getting their clients to pass foils to them. Okay, I'm banning this. You are. Clients don't have to work. Right. You don't need to use a board. Okay, well, I'm just saying that's the way I know how to do my highlights. I'm not going to sit here and pretend to know everything about how women's hair works, but if the professional standard is to not do highlights with a board, then her answer should not be, that's just the way I know how to do it. Well, okay, learn how to do it right. Just because you passed beauty school doesn't mean you're done. If beauty school is like anything else, then they taught you the bare minimum to do your job. If you are actually going to get good and make money, you need to learn new things all the time, forever. If you have owned a hair salon for 10 years, you shouldn't have the exact same hairstylist skills as you did when you first opened the business. My understanding of Tabitha's disgust of the use of foil boards is that it forces clients to do some of the work. In this picture, you can see the client holding the board for the stylist. That's like going to the auto mechanic and having the guy ask you to pass him wrenches while he is working on your car. I'm not going to pay for that. He should have staff that does that. I'm here to be taken care of. But instead, what we consistently get from Kim is that she doesn't care about any of this. Your haircuts definitely need some work. Tabitha's picking on me because I'm the owner. She has to. But I'm not going to think like, oh my God, I'm the worst person in the world because Tabitha said I suck. I don't really care. Here we see Kim avoiding negative feelings about her skill and resisting self-improvement. Also, just for perspective, this is what she said earlier in the episode. Which doesn't sound like you care. I know, because it's my misperception that I tend to give out a lot. This is my personality. I mean, this is just how I am. This is just my personality. It's just who I am. Wow, it's almost as if people perceive that you don't care because you openly tell them that you don't care. If a bunch of people say the same thing about you, that needs to be investigated. They are saying that for a reason, and they are concerned because people who don't care don't self-improve. People who don't self-improve don't run successful businesses. That's why your staff insults you in front of their clients. I think Tabitha gets it right when she says this. Clients can tell when it's wow and when it's mediocre, and wow keeps them coming back. I think this is the number one thing people don't get when they are unsuccessful. Your skill is the most important thing. If you aren't good, no matter what job it is, people aren't going to pay you. The only way you get good is to learn all the time and to risk failure from trying new things. I mean, that's really why people don't get good in the first place. They don't want to put in the effort and they don't want to take the risk, particularly when the risk of failure makes them look bad. Honestly, if you want to be good at something, then you need to look like an idiot first. Get used to it. Kim's major excuse for not doing any of this stuff is that she has a three and a five-year-old and they take up all of her time. Supposedly, she was great with her business up until the point they were born. Personally, I think that this is actually a good excuse. In life, you can't have everything, and if you want to be effective, you have to make sacrifices. Raise your kids or have a career, you can't do both. In my opinion, since her husband already works, I think it would have been better for her family if she gave up the salon, but in the end, Kim chose to keep her salon and put the kids in daycare. Now, the great thing about this show is that it aired a bunch of years ago, so we can see what happened to the salon. Kim's episode aired back in March of 2012, and more than eight years later, she is still in business. Based on the show's success rate, she had about a 50-50 shot at succeeding. Looks like she actually ended up taking the advice. So we have a happy ending, and surprise, surprise, this stuff works. I've said before that success is not magic or luck. It's a skill that you build through a lot of effort. If you make the right interventions, eventually things will start working out. Really, the only difficult thing is being able to diagnose which problems you personally have that are in your way. That is what most of your time will be spent on. If you can't figure that stuff out, then look outside of yourself for the answer. Your problems might not be apparent to you, but they are likely very apparent to someone else who knows you. If you watch the entire employee feedback session from the episode, you'll see that the whole staff knows what's wrong with the business. Kim just wasn't listening to feedback. 
if there is something wrong with you, chances are someone has already told you what that thing is. It's your job to honestly think about what they said and determine if it was right or not. If they are right, think about how you can fix it. If you still don't have the answer, you can invest in therapy, you can find a mentor, you can watch lots of YouTube videos. There are plenty of ways to find these answers if you spend the time looking. But with that said, I think that's enough for this video. So if you liked it, hit the like button, subscribe if you're new, comment and share. If you would like to support this channel, then you can do so with PayPal, Patreon, or Subscribestar. You can find those links in the description. Last, if you haven't checked me out on BitChute or Parler, you can also find those links in the description. Otherwise, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.